number. So we're going to look at, uh, again, looking back at desired sample size, interpreting confidence levels. Um, actually, that's more like explaining what a confidence level is, like what does that 95% mean in a 95% confidence interval. Uh, interpreting p-values and statistical significance. So these are just kind of ancillary topics that we need to throw in with the other two that we did. So um, we'll start out with perhaps the big E, and this one is in your portfolio, desired sample size. Um, there is actually a desired sample size for means, but it's a little bit more abstract. We really only do those for proportions. and um, when you calculate desired sample size, it's going to be based on the formula for a confidence interval. So it's this part right here. It's the margin of error portion that we use. And um, yeah, so let's go for it. So here's an example. I figured let's just go with it um, through example. So you've got an article, what kind of people do not use seat belts? reported on a survey with the objective of studying characteristics of drivers and seatbelt usage. Let P promote the proportion of all drivers of cars with seat belts who use them. Suppose that at the onset of the study, that means before it started, the investigators wish to estimate P to within 2.02 um, that's like plus or minus 0 0.02 with a 99% confidence. So what's the required sample size? All right, um, for proportions, your margin of error part of your confidence interval is this. You know, margin of error is Z star times the square root of P hat times one minus P hat over N. Um, that's what we need except P hat is a proportion that we get from sampling, which means that we would have already gotten our sample size and we would have already done our research. So that's kind of like not in the right order. So you won't know the P hat ahead of time. So we have to guess, remember that? So we use P star, yet another letter P that's thrown into that proportion section. That uh, is gonna be either from a pilot study or from some kind of similar studies from a journal if you don't have any kind of uh, pilot study value to go by, then you opt for the conservative P star equals 0.5. Up here, there was no pilot study referenced. So we're going to use P star equals 0.5. So that goes here and here. All right. So if it's 99% confidence, you can go to your T star Z star table, 2.576. M is 0 0.02, that's 2%, and we're using that P star of 0.5. So uh, this is the modified formula that replaces P hat with P star, and then you just plug those numbers in. So 0 0.02, 2.576, 0 0.51, minus 0 0.5. Now I'm not gonna go through all of the algebra. I'm gonna imagine that that's something you can handle but if you do it correctly, and you might want to try it, you get 4,147.36. Now the 0.36 is not right for people because we're counting these and we have no, no room for any kind of a partial person or any decimals or fractions. So what to do? Don't round this down because if you do, remember smaller sample sizes um, have more error we want to be within this margin of error. So we're going to have to bump up, go up, right? If it's 4,147.0, you can leave it like that. But anything beyond that goes up. And that's the minimum sample size that we want. All right, interpreting a confidence level. So if we're, uh, if we're creating a 95% confidence interval, what does that number 95% mean? And this is the kind of thing that College Board asks about all the time. And they know exactly the way kids misinterpret it. And they always put those things into multiple choice questions with all of the wrong answers in the, um, in the answer sections as foils. And kids grab them. They just do. 
So um, we're going to have to get better than that. So it's not that your your interval as works at estimating the true parameter 95% of the time because that sample result, that one sample result, either did trap the correct uh, parameter that you're looking for or it didn't. Like It's not like that interval worked today and won't work tomorrow and then another day beyond that it will work. It's either successful or it's not, right? So just what does the 95% mean? All right, remember what a confidence interval does. It um, estimates a true population parameter from a sample. It's a sample estimate for a population parameter and it gives you a range of values that you hope the true parameter is in. Now, if you got a different sample, you may not capture that parameter. And then the third sample might capture, the fourth might capture, and the fifth might not, right? Based on different samples of whatever your sample size happens to be. So this means that the outcome we got is based on a method. It's the method that is, you know, successful at this rate. Um, that's, uh, it's based on a method that successfully estimates the true parameter in 95% of all possible samples of the size we use, right? So if there are billions upon billions of samples of size 35 for estimating the true height of women, um, out of all of those possible samples, we'll, we'll get a confidence interval for each one and 95% of them will have, will have worked and capture the true parameter and 5% will just be a fail, all right? So it's the process that is successful at this rate. If the problem says, that uses the word probability, probability and confidence are close, but really they're different, uh, don't pick the answer choice that says probability. Okay, another thing that College Board asks is what is this p-value mean? And this is another thing uh, that I realize now that I think about it is part of your portfolio. So you do a test of significance, you get a p-value of 0.1217. What does that number means, mean rather? Okay, this is what it means. A p-value of 0.1217 means that if HO is true, we will see our sample result or one even more extreme 12.17% of the time. Now it's up to you to judge whether that sample outcome being that or that or more extreme being this likely to happen is a common occurrence or a rare occurrence. If it's, you feel like it's a common occurrence, then you won't reject HO. If you feel that it's a rare occurrence, that means you shouldn't really be seeing it if HO is true, perhaps then HO is not true, okay? So, um, so by the way, in our case, 12.17% is not really that rare of an occurrence. You know, we normally pick an alpha, like a rejection point of 0.05. That means we're going to accept um, HO when we get sample results that generate p-values all the way down to 0.05. Anything less than that, that's when we start rejecting. So if you mentally compare 12.17% to say an alpha of 0.05 or even an alpha of 0.10 as a cut point between uh, rejecting and failing to reject, um, this is not so extreme as to force us to reject, right? And here is the geometry behind it. So if your p-value is 0.1217, that means that your sample outcome started this little blue area, and so it was that, that great of a sample outcome or higher, this extreme or higher, given that HO is true. And that's a fairly substantial amount of this curve, so the likelihood of seeing that if HO is true is fairly high. I don't think we should reject this. But let's just say you get a p-value of 0.0230, which means it's a little over 2% of the time you would see a sample outcome that much or higher. Um, that's a little tiny sliver. If you get this and you did all of your, you know, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? If you did all your procedures correctly, then what you did is pretty defensible. You've got evidence that HO should be rejected. 
So if HO is true, this outcome is pretty rare. We shouldn't see it. So since we did see it, then HO, we've got evidence against it. It might not be true and we reject it. That's what a p-value means. All right, so the last thing we're gonna look at is statistical significance, and that's really versus practical significance. Um, when HO can be rejected at the usual level, so we just talked about 0.05, 0 0.10, that's pretty good evidence that you know there's an effect present, something that makes you believe that HO isn't true, that something else is. But this effect may be small. So when large samples are available, even tiny deviations from HO may be significant. We're talking about big, big samples. So um, statistically significant does not always mean practically significant. Like you may look at a difference between what your HO value is and what your sample outcome is and say, you know, just by looking at that, that's not too big of a deal. Um, but even so, I'm getting a small p-value, which kind of is trying to force me to reject. It's probably because your sample size is way too big. And what happens is your curve grows really tall and skinny at the center and the tails collapse. So you just don't have really a whole lot of air area there in order for you to get a big p-value. So when an outcome is practically significant, it means that that outcome really does matter in real life. That you know, it does capture your attention, you know, your sample outcome relative to your um, HO value. This is the exact example we used when we learned this. So they're saying that the math S SAT scores are normal with a mean of 475 and a, a standard deviation of 10. These are parameters, population values. Um, so you take an SAT prep class and you get a score of 478 or your class average is 478 on practice tests and um, wow so that's not a big difference that's only three points on an SAT scale so let's just see how it shows up in a test of significance so let's say the class has a hundred a thousand or ten thousand and here's HO and HA remember HO HA rather is that mu is greater than and is three points, does that really matter as being an improvement over you know, the population average? So this is using alpha of 0.05 for a sample of 100, p value is pretty big, we wouldn't reject. Now let's boot, I'm sorry, this is your sample size. Now let's boost it to 1,000, all right? Um, yeah, that made your p value shrink, but 0.1714, that's not all that small, but once you hit 10,000, your curve is so tall and skinny and your tails are so vacant of area that there's almost very little to, to have for a p-value that's significant. Um, so yeah, we do get a p-value that's wildly significant. In other words, in that tail, there's just not much area, so when you're in it, you're not going to get very big p-values and here we didn't and you could reject but what you're seeing is just an overall amplification of an extremely large n value all right so those are the topics um, i told you that let's see if i'm still here yeah here i am so um continue on with things um check in during office hours if you have questions um you're pretty much good to go. The only thing that's uh, remaining is a little bit of a lecture tomorrow on error analysis and then I'll be done for the week. Um, just work steady. Don't do too much at once, but if you do two, maybe some days three in a day of those problems, you're going to get done no problem. And free test grade basically because 50% um, of it is just completion. And so 16 per, uh, points per the ones I choose to grade will come uh, give you the other half. But don't forget, I'm grading, you know, each little part of e uh, each problem. You know, I'm, in other words, I'm cutting up the 16 points into, you know, defining the parameter, stating HOHA if that's what the problem calls for, getting 
your assumptions right and all that kind of thing. So you you should get an A on this. You really should if you put some effort into it. So on that note, um, keep hunkering down, stay well, stay safe, stay happy, and uh, we'll check in again tomorrow. Adios. Bye-bye.